Hi, I'm Mr. New Jersey. This is the fourth installment of a multi-part crash course in New Jersey government and politics. If you haven't already, you should watch the previous videos of this series before watching this one, because these videos are designed to build off one another, and I will not be repeating information. Today we will cover the judicial branch of New Jersey's government, aka the New Jersey court system, which revolves around disputes about the application and interpretation of laws. This video will cover a lot of ground, some of it basic concepts of the judicial system, and some of it more complex stuff relating to the specific courts of the court system. I'll put timestamps in the video description, so feel free to jump to whatever topics interest you most. Part 1. Types of Cases and Courts The court system deals with two basic types of cases. Civil cases are disputes between parties, which typically arise because one person or entity sues another for redress of grievances. Criminal cases are where the government charges a person with a crime, and the courts must determine their innocence or guilt. NJ's court system is composed of trial courts and appellate courts. Cases are initiated in trial courts. Trial courts hear the facts of the case and decide which side is right and which is wrong. Most cases start and end in trial court. Appellate courts hear appeals, where one side in a case, almost always the losing side, argues that there was an error in the proceedings of the court that just heard the case. There can be multiple levels of appeals. For instance, if one side feels that the proceedings used by an appellate court were wrong, they can appeal it to a higher level appellate court. Note, however, that if an appeal is successful, the case might not end. Rather, the appellate court might send the case back to the trial level to be redone, with the error corrected. Now it's time to talk about jurisdiction, a topic closely related to those we just discussed. Jurisdiction is a given court's right to hear certain types of cases. The jurisdiction of a given court might be limited by factors such as the geographic area the case is from, the subject matter of the case, and whether the case is currently in the trial or appeal phase. Original jurisdiction refers to when a court has the right to be the first court to hear a case as a trial. This is as opposed to appellate jurisdiction, where a court only has a right to hear a case on appeal. Part 2. The Figures Involved in a Case In the court system, the entities with something at stake in a case are called parties to the case. And in any given case, there are two main parties. In civil cases, the entity that brings the case is known as the plaintiff, and the entity the case is brought against is called the defendant. For example, if person A sues person B, person A is the plaintiff and person B is the defendant. In criminal cases, the state fills the role of plaintiff and its lawyers are called prosecutors. The defendant is still called the defendant, but you'll often hear the defendant in criminal cases referred to as the accused due to their having been accused of a crime. It's important to note, however, that the accused is always presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. At the appellate level, the party that brings the appeal is called the appellant, and the party that responds to the appeal is called the respondent. Besides the parties to a case, it's also important to discuss lawyers, judges, witnesses, and juries. We'll begin with lawyers, who are sometimes referred to as attorneys or counselors. Lawyers are professionals trained to understand the ins and outs of the court system and the law who the parties to a case may hire to manage their side of the case. When a party to a case is an individual, whether or not to hire a lawyer is a choice left up to them. However, if a party is a corporation, there are certain civil cases where they may be required to hire a lawyer. In any case, although hiring a lawyer is typically optional, most parties generally hire lawyers because lawyers are practiced at the art of getting views across effectively know the rules and procedures that must be followed in the court, and have a sense of what judges and juries look for when deciding cases. Thus, in court cases, it's usually the lawyers who are standing up making arguments on behalf of the parties, rather than the parties themselves talking. Parties to a case who a lawyer represents are called the lawyer's clients, and the act of a lawyer providing services to a client is called practicing law. In order to become a lawyer, a person has to graduate from law school, and even then, they can't immediately practice law in a given court. The ability to practice law in a given court or court system is called being admitted to the bar in that court. 
the symbolism of a bar goes back to old-style courthouses, where lawyers would literally stand behind a wooden bar in order to talk to the judge. Although courts rarely have physical bars anymore, most court systems, including New Jersey's, have something called a bar exam, which is an exam that lawyers must pass in order to be admitted to the bar in that court system. The exam is designed to test that lawyer's knowledge of the court system, including major cases, relevant laws, and court procedures. However, passing the New Jersey bar exam does not guarantee that a given lawyer will be allowed to practice law in our court system. In particular, the lawyers still have to go through an ethics evaluation, which is designed to ensure that only lawyers of good moral character are admitted to our bar. The evaluation examines things such as whether or not the lawyers have broken any major laws, and often denies those who have. Furthermore, if lawyers who are already admitted to the bar are caught breaking laws or various court rules, they can actually be disbarred, which means that their admission to the bar is revoked. Before we move on from the topic of the bar, I want to briefly mention pro hoc vice admission to the bar, which means admission to the bar for one case only. The way this works is that sometimes a lawyer admitted to the bar in another state can be admitted to the New Jersey bar for a single case without going through all the regular procedures in order to make the case go smoother and more quickly. That's all for the bar. Now we'll move on to the next attorney-related topic. The New Jersey Constitution guarantees defendants in criminal proceedings the right to an attorney. It's worth noting that the federal level's U.S. Constitution has a similar provision that applies to both the state and federal court systems. Furthermore, there are certain types of cases where the government is required to provide a person with an attorney, even if the person can't afford to pay for an attorney themselves. Attorneys provided by the government for this purpose are called public defenders. Note that even though public defenders are provided for people who can't afford an attorney on the private market, the government will still generally try to collect some small amount of money from the person who received the public defender, potentially within a significant payback window because the people who use public defenders tend to be poor. We'll talk more about public defenders and the specific situations in which they're provided later on, after we've discussed the specific courts of the court system. Now we'll move on to another important figure in court cases, the judge. Every court has one or more judges assigned to it. In trial courts, each case is presided over by a single judge, whereas in appellate courts, cases are usually presided over by a panel of judges. Judgeships are actually a form of political office, and judges serve a fixed-length term. The process of becoming a judge and the length of a judge's term differ from court to court, so we'll hold off on discussing those details until we get to the specific courts of the court system. A major role of judges is to manage the proceedings of the court. Examples of this management role include resolving disputes between parties about what evidence may be admitted in the court, making sure parties only speak when it is their turn, and intervening when parties ask biased or misleading questions to witnesses. By the way, witnesses are people brought into the court by either party to describe concepts or events that might be relevant to the case. Either party can bring in witnesses and ask them questions, but whenever a party does this, the other party gets the opportunity to ask the witness questions as well. Asking questions to a witness brought in by the other party is called a cross-examination. Next, we need to talk a bit about juries. Juries are groups of citizens selected from the geographic jurisdiction in which a trial is going to take place, who listen to the facts of a case and decide which side is right and which is wrong. The main purpose of juries is to ensure that justice is not handed out directly by the government in a tyrannical or unfair fashion. However, the use of juries is limited to certain types of cases. Appeals do not have juries, and whether or not trials have juries depends on which specific trial court they're taking place in. But as we'll see later on in the video, it's generally the most serious trials that have juries, whereas more minor trials are less likely to have them. Furthermore, in criminal trials that use juries, there are usually 12 jurors who must be unanimous in their verdict. Verdict, by the way, means their decision about the outcome of the case. In civil trials that use juries, the number of jurors is more fluid, but common numbers are 6 or 12. Whatever the number, five-sixths of the jurors must agree on the verdict. Unless there are fewer than six jurors, 
in which case the verdict must be unanimous. In any case, if the necessary number of jurors can't agree on a verdict, the judge might declare a mistrial, in which instance either the trial has to be redone or the case may be thrown out of the court system entirely. In criminal trials, the decision of whether to back out or to redo the case is left up to the government, since the defendant can't just nix the charges against them. Because jury duty is supposed to be by common citizens rather than government employees, all Americans are legally obliged to serve as jurors when called upon. So, how does New Jersey decide which citizens will serve as jurors? The state creates one list that includes the names of registered voters, licensed drivers, filers of New Jersey personal income tax returns, and applicants for home rebates. The state then uses a computer to select names from this list randomly. Far more names are selected than will ultimately be used in the trial, but all of those selected from the list will be sent mail telling them to show up at a designated location, usually the county courthouse. Once there, a process ensues that hones in on those who will actually be used in the jury. Sometimes, jurors are dismissed because of work or travel plans that can't be accommodated in the court schedule. Other times, jurors are dismissed because of potential sources of bias, such as knowing one of the parties involved in the case the jury is for. Ultimately, there should be enough suitable jurors to fill up the jury. In some trials, even more jurors than are necessary are chosen. The purpose of these extra jurors is to ensure that in trials where there is a mandatory number of jurors, even if some of the jurors get sick or are otherwise unable to finish hearing the case, there will still be the total number of jurors required and the whole case won't have to be redone. Sometimes, in the sorts of civil cases where a fluid number of jurors is allowed, these jurors will simply be added into the general jury. Other times, such as in criminal trials where a hard number of jurors is required, these jurors will be designated as alternate jurors and will sit in the courtroom to hear the trial, but will only deliberate with the jury to determine a verdict if one of the original jurors drops out. With all that talk of how juries work out of the way, remember the cases without juries? Well, cases without juries are decided directly by the judge, or, if there are a panel of judges, the judges vote to decide the outcome. Part 3. The Structure of Criminal Cases First of all, there's a special kind of jury called a grand jury, which is used prior to trials for really serious crimes. A grand jury only hears from the prosecutors, not the defendant, and its purpose is to determine whether there is enough evidence to bother having a trial at all. If a grand jury determines that there is enough evidence to have a person stand trial, the person is said to have been indicted. If you've ever heard the phrase indictable offense, this is basically what it's referring to. An indictable offense is an offense so serious that a grand jury will be used prior to a potential trial. Anyway, a grand jury can have up to 23 members, and 12 must agree to issue an indictment. Assuming a person is indicted, or the offense in question isn't serious enough to merit having a grand jury at all. The accused will then have an arraignment, where the defendant will be brought before a judge who will read the charges against them. The judge will then ask the defendant to enter a plea, and the defendant can plead either guilty or not guilty. A guilty plea automatically convicts the defendant of the charges and begins the sentencing phase of court proceedings, where the convict's punishment is decided. Theoretically, a guilty plea means that the defendant admits they committed the crime described in the charges, though as we'll see later on, in reality, there are reasons why a defendant might plead guilty even if they did not commit the crime. By comparison, a not guilty plea means that the defendant says they did not commit the crime described in the charges. A not guilty plea initiates a trial, where prosecutors present their evidence and bring in witnesses to try to prove that the defendant committed the crime and the defendant can bring in their own witnesses' evidence and to make their own arguments to try to counter the allegations against them. After this, depending on which specific court the trial is taking place in, it will be up to either the judge or jury to decide whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty. A not guilty verdict removes the charges against the defendant, and it is said that the defendant has been acquitted of the charges, whereas a guilty verdict means that the defendant is convicted of the crime and will be sentenced. It's important to note here that in trials where a jury is used to determine the verdict, 
the judge can actually overrule the jury if the jury gives the defendant a guilty verdict. Thus, the judge would be giving the defendant a not guilty verdict. Whereas the judge cannot overrule the jury if the jury gives the defendant a not guilty verdict. Even in criminal trials where a jury is used to decide the verdict, it is the judge, rather than the jury, who decides what the convict's sentence will be, within parameters set out in the law. Back when New Jersey had the death penalty, the one exception was that in cases where the death penalty was a possibility, the jury would get to decide between giving the convict the death penalty or life in prison. Now that New Jersey has abolished the death penalty, that's no longer a part of our court system, but it is still true at the federal level, which still uses the death penalty. By comparison, in civil trials, depending on what type of civil trial it is, it may be the judge or jury who decides what the losing side has to do for the winning side, such as how much money the losing side has to pay the winning side. Before we move on from the topic of criminal trials, it's important to note that if there are multiple charges against a defendant, the defendant can choose to plead guilty to some and not guilty to others, and among the charges that go to trial, a jury can convict a defendant of some charges and acquit the defendant of others. Part 4. Cases that don't make it to trial A lot of cases in the court system don't make it to the trial phase at all. You see, most civil cases actually end in settlement negotiations prior to the trial, which is when the lawyers from both sides talk to each other and work out a compromise solution. There is also a more formal process similar to settlement negotiations called mediation, where the two parties are brought together with a third, neutral party who is a professional arbitrator to try to work out their disagreement. Similarly, many criminal cases end because the defendant pleads guilty. There are lots of reasons a defendant might plead guilty, whether they committed the crime or not. For instance, they might know that the government has so much evidence against them that they couldn't possibly win the trial. Furthermore, if they're actually guilty, they might just be remorseful about what they did. However, the reason that defendants might plead guilty that I want to talk about the most is called plea bargaining, which is a tool prosecutors have at their disposal to convince people to plead guilty, whether they're innocent or not. See, the government would rather have people plead guilty than go to trial because it will save them time and money. And defendants know that if they go to trial, the verdict could come out either way. Knowing all this, if there are multiple charges the government could bring against someone, they may promise that if the defendant pleads guilty to the more minor of the charges, they'll drop the more serious ones, leading to a lighter sentence. Furthermore, even if there's only one charge facing a person, Prosecutors may tell them that if the person pleads guilty to the charge, they'll recommend to the judge that the person receive a lighter sentence. Part 5. Judicial Review Judicial review is a court's ability to invalidate laws that it finds to be incompatible with higher-ranking laws, especially the U.S. and state constitutions, with the U.S. Constitution being the highest-ranking law on the land. For example, the federal government's U.S. Supreme Court has used its power of judicial review to overturn bans on flag burning. It has done this because it finds that flag burning is constitutionally protected by the free speech clause of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And the U.S. Constitution overrides laws passed by either the federal or state governments. The U.S. Supreme Court is not the only court with the power of judicial review. Many courts, at both the federal and state levels, exercise it to some extent or another, because they have to sort out the hierarchy of conflicting laws and side with the highest-ranking laws in that hierarchy when deciding cases. However, when courts in the lower part of the judicial pyramid exercise judicial review in areas where there hasn't yet been precedent from higher courts, the cases tend to quickly get appealed up to the higher courts, and possibly to either the state or federal Supreme Court, which make the final determination on whether or not the lower court's use of judicial review was appropriate. The high court's ruling thus sets precedent for lower courts to follow in examining similar cases in the future. Part 6. The Specific Courts That Make Up New Jersey's Court System Most cases in the New Jersey court system occur entirely within municipal courts. Municipal courts are courts that have jurisdiction limited to one or several municipalities. Municipal courts hear trials only, not appeals. Municipal courts typically deal with relatively minor subject matter, such as traffic and parking violations and misdemeanors. Municipal courts do not have juries. 
Another part of the New Jersey court system is the tax court. It hears appeals on decisions made by county boards of taxation and by the director of the state's division of taxation on issues such as property tax assessments, home rebates, income and business taxes, etc. Basically, the tax court is the arm of the judiciary aimed at ensuring that the state's tax laws are applied fairly and consistently. The tax court does not use juries, and it has statewide jurisdiction in its admittedly limited subject area. The next court to be aware of is the Superior Court of New Jersey, which has statewide jurisdiction in more general subject matter. When I say it has statewide jurisdiction, however, know that that doesn't mean that there is one body of judges who hear all of the cases statewide. Rather, the Superior Court is split into different divisions that hear different types of cases. Furthermore, within each division, certain of its judges are assigned to hear its cases in one of 15 vicinages, which are geographic units comprising one or more counties. So, it's helpful to think of the Superior Court as actually several different courts with statewide jurisdiction, rather than as a single court, even though the name sounds like it's a single court. You should know a bit about the specific divisions of the Superior Court. Two of the divisions, the Law Division and the Chancery Division, deal mostly with trials, whereas the Appellate Division deals entirely with appeals. As a result, you may sometimes hear of the Law and Chancery Divisions referred to collectively as the trial divisions of the Superior Court. The Law Division hears the criminal cases that are too serious for municipal courts, such as trials for indictable offenses. The Law Division also hears civil trials where the main issue at stake is money. The Law Division's criminal trials generally have juries, whereas its civil trials for small amounts of money generally don't. And whether or not its civil trials for large amounts of money do depends on whether or not either or both of the parties demand that a jury be used. In contrast, the Chancery Division deals with civil trials that are matters of equity. Equity in this case means that the primary redress of grievances at stake is not money. For example, person A might sue person B because a tree on person B's property is leaning over person A's yard, and person A wants person B to cut the tree down. Related to equity and also part of the Chancery Division are family cases, which include issues such as divorce, child custody, domestic violence, etc. Lastly, the Chancery Division handles probate matters such as wills. Chancery Division trials generally do not have juries. The last division we need to talk about is the Appellate Division, which hears appeals that can come from the Municipal Courts, the Tax Court, or the other divisions of the Superior Court. The Appellate Division does not use juries. And typically, its cases are heard by a panel of three judges. Now we can move on to the New Jersey Supreme Court, which is the highest court in New Jersey's judicial pyramid. What I mean by the top of the judicial pyramid is that this is the highest appeals court in New Jersey, and that its rulings override the rulings of all of New Jersey's other courts. However, it's important to note that the rulings of the New Jersey Supreme Court do not override the rulings of federal courts and that sometimes New Jersey Supreme Court cases can be appealed up to the U.S. Supreme Court at the federal level. The New Jersey Supreme Court does not use juries. Much like the federal Supreme Court, the New Jersey Supreme Court gets so many requests for appeals that it cannot possibly hear them all. For this reason, it usually gets to pick and choose which appeals to hear, and it generally only picks those that will help it set precedent for the lower courts to follow in deciding future cases. For example, imagine that seven lower courts hear cases about whether or not the right to privacy prevents police from camping outside of somebody's house without their consent. If three of the lower courts rule that it does violate the right to privacy, and four of the lower courts rule that it does not, the New Jersey Supreme Court might choose to hear one case addressing the issue, on the understanding that all future cases about the issue will be decided according to how it rules in this one. Like the federal Supreme Court, New Jersey's Supreme Court lacks the power to directly enforce its decisions, but its rulings are generally respected and followed by the other organs of the government. Despite what I just said about picking and choosing its cases, there are a few incredibly rare circumstances defined in New Jersey's Constitution where the New Jersey Supreme Court will be required to hear a case, 
For example, if a panel of judges in the appellate division of the New Jersey Superior Court are not unanimous in deciding a case, the losing side has an automatic right to appeal to the New Jersey Supreme Court. This kind of appeal is called an appeal as of right, whereas when the Supreme Court chooses to hear a case, it is said that the court has granted certification to the case. The New Jersey Supreme Court has seven justices, who are one chief justice and six associate justices. The chief justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court is also the administrative overseer of the entire New Jersey judicial system. As of January 2018, the chief justice is Stuart Rabner, Note that only judges of the state and federal Supreme Courts are called justices. Judges of all other courts are simply called judges. An unofficial tradition dictates that at any given time, three justices are Democrats, three justices are Republicans, and either there is an independent justice or one additional justice from the governor's party. As of January 2018, there are three Democrats, three Republicans, and one independent. The tradition of maintaining a partisan balance on our Supreme Court has given New Jersey's judiciary a long history of fairness and nonpartisanship that neither the federal government nor most other states can claim. This tradition of partisan balance has been remarkably enduring, such that even when one party has complete control of state government, they've been willing to install justices from the other party. Part 7. The Selection of Judges and Justices in New Jersey the process of becoming a judge in New Jersey differs based on the specific court in question. To become a justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court, or a judge of the Superior or Tax Courts, one must first have been a member of the New Jersey Bar for 10 years. They must then be nominated by the governor and confirmed by the state senate. Once confirmed, they serve as a justice or a judge for 7 years. Once the 7 years are up, the governor decides whether or not to nominate them for tenure. If the governor re-nominates a judge or justice, the state senate must decide whether or not to reconfirm them. If reconfirmed, the position is theirs until the mandatory retirement age of 70. Here are some additional judicial selection rules to note that apply specifically to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Firstly, when there is a vacancy on the New Jersey Supreme Court, the chief justice can choose a superior court judge to fill the position temporarily until a new justice is approved via the normal process. Secondly, the process of becoming Chief Justice is the same as that of becoming an Associate Justice. It has nothing to do with seniority on the court. So, if the Chief Justice's position becomes vacant, the Governor can either choose to nominate someone completely new to the court to be Chief Justice, or to nominate a current Associate Justice to become Chief Justice, and then nominate someone new to fill the Associate Justice's former seat. The State Senate, of course, must approve all of these nominations. The process for becoming a municipal court judge differs based on whether the court covers one municipality or multiple municipalities. If it's a municipal court that covers one municipality, a person has to be approved by the municipal government, which typically means being appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the municipal council, though the process can vary with the government structure of the municipality. Municipal court judges serve three-year terms and there is no tenure, but they can serve an infinite number of terms, and there is no mandatory retirement age. To become the judge of a municipal court that serves multiple municipalities, a person must be appointed by the governor and confirmed by the state senate. Once again, the terms last three years, there is no tenure, no limit on the total number of terms that can be served, and no mandatory retirement age. The process of becoming a judge or justice in New Jersey is different from the process in many other states. This is because many states have some or all of their judges and justices elected by the people. The reason New Jersey does not have elected judges is because of the view that having judges face re-election compromises their neutrality, potentially causing them to judge cases and hand out sentences based on what will play well with voters, rather than on what is legally and ethically proper. Part 8. Topics about lawyers that I couldn't cover effectively until after we had gone through the specific courts of the court system. Mostly, this section will deal with how public defenders, prosecutors, and the state's other lawyers are hired and organized, since that varies from court to court. Municipal courts are fairly easy, so we'll get those out of the way first. Municipal governments hire lawyers who are allowed to practice in this state to serve as public defenders and prosecutors in their respective courts. 
Municipal public defenders are generally only provided in cases where the defendant is at risk of going to jail, losing driving privileges, or may have to pay a substantial fine. What about the public defenders in New Jersey who are in courts other than municipal courts? Well, most of them are organized through the Office of the Public Defender. The office provides public defenders in both trials and appeals, providing public defenders in criminal cases for indictable offenses, as well as cases where a person has been involuntarily committed to a state psychiatric facility, cases where parents are at risk of losing their parental rights or child custody, and juvenile delinquency cases. The office also provides attorneys for children in cases where the children are alleged to have been abused. Note that the head of the Office of the Public Defender is a political position whose holder is appointed by the governor and confirmed by the state senate for a five-year term. But most of the regular public defenders are hired employees, assigned to specific counties. That's all for public defenders. Now we need to talk about something called the Department of Law and Public Safety, which is headed by New Jersey's Attorney General. The Attorney General is appointed by the governor and confirmed by the state senate after which they serve a term concurrent with the governor. Getting back to the department itself, the department is basically New Jersey's main department dedicated to law enforcement, doing a diverse array of things from policing to judicial work. For this video, we'll just focus on the judicial work. The department provides legal counsel to the state and its various agencies, and it often manages the state's civil cases directly with its own employed lawyers. However, sometimes the state contracts out private lawyers to handle civil cases. As for criminal trials, we already talked about the municipal court ones, so it's really just the superior court ones we have to worry about now. The Attorney General and his office can prosecute cases directly, but more often, the state's prosecutorial work is organized through county prosecutor's offices in each county, to which the Attorney General and his office provide oversight and support. The head of each prosecutor's office is called the county prosecutor. To become county prosecutor, the person must be appointed by the governor and confirmed by the state senate for a five-year term. However, most of the prosecutors who work in the prosecutor's offices are not political appointees, but rather are employees of the offices. Part 9. Tourism There aren't any tours of New Jersey's state courthouses as far as I know, though Americans have a constitutional right to attend the vast majority of court sessions at all levels of government. So, if you want a better idea of what court proceedings are like, you can always check the schedule of a courthouse near you, pick a case you find interesting, show up and watch it. Just note that you'll be expected to go through security when entering the courthouse. You won't be allowed to use your phone or talk during the case, and it's recommended that you dress nicely. If you decide you want to see a New Jersey Supreme Court case, The court is located in the Richard J. Hughes Justice Complex, 25 Market Street, Trenton, New Jersey, 08611. The New Jersey Supreme Court also has a virtual museum, which I will link in the video description. I hope you found this video enjoyable and informative. The next video in this series will cover how New Jersey is represented in the federal government. So if you want to be notified when that video is released, you should consider subscribing to the channel. Have a nice day, and I'll see you next time.